The last few weeks we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and I told you as we've talked about Mark that Mark's kind of an exciting gospel because there's all sorts of miracles, there's all sorts of amazing things that happens, and Mark in his gospel really highlights all these miracles, and so sometimes it can kind of be a, a quick hit moving from action story to action story, and there's people healed in one story, and then someone's reaching out and touching Jesus' garment in another story, and she's healed, and there's all these amazing things that are happening. Well, last week we got to a text where there was a transition then to a little more of Jesus' teaching, which a lot of the other gospel writers like Matthew spend a lot more time and focus on. Well, this week there's another shift, and as Jesus has gone around and been a miracle worker and been doing these signs and wonders, there's now a shift to something that feels a little darker, because Jesus is beginning to point towards how this story, at least his earthly story, is going to end, and it's going to end with his persecution, it's going to end with his death. And so I want you, as we think about this passage, to put your feet in the same feet of the disciples and think about this emotional roller coaster you would begin to be going on. So you've walked with Jesus, you've been drawn to Jesus, he's got crowds gathered around him, he's having all sorts of things he's able to teach to these larger crowds, and as he's doing that, there's these amazing things that no one has ever seen before that he's doing as he walks down this path. People are being healed. People are having experiences that no one has ever seen before. He's calming storms, calming the seas. And you would think, you would begin to feel all the excitement that everything that is broken in the world is finally going to be made right again because of this man. And there should be that excitement. We should have that excitement as we go alongside of him. But as we get in this passage, Jesus starts to walk them towards his death, towards what's going to happen, and they start to balk a little bit. It's not the story that they expected. It's not what they expected to happen next. When I was in uh, seminary, I actually was a youth pastor at a church in uh, this kind of small college town. And as I was serving as youth pastor, one of the things we did one year during Lent is we had all the youth do silhouettes of all the Stations of the Cross. If you grew up Catholic, you know that a lot of times Catholic churches have these Stations of the Cross that are around the walls inside their church building. And there are all these scenes, biblical scenes, of all the things that happened in Jesus' journey leading up to his death and his resurrection, called Stations of the Cross. And so what we did is we put up a big screen, and we had a bright light behind that screen, and then all the youth dressed up, and we acted out each of those scenes in a very reflective, contemplative service to help people remember all these last aspects of Jesus' life. And the service was really meaningful. It's, it's not a real joyous service. It's a reflective service. And afterwards, we had everybody leave in silence. And I still remember right after the service, someone came up to me, and they were really frustrated by the service. They were a little angry. And they said, I do not understand how you could have a worship service that was so dark and sad and difficult. He said, the resurrection is joyful. It's a celebration. Why in the world are we focused on these types of things? And first, I felt really deflated because it took a lot of work to get all those high school kids involved and be able to pull this off with no one punching each other and the screen not falling down and all those things that go into youth ministry. But then we had a really good conversation, and what I said to him was, and I doubt I used this exact language, it was a long time ago, but I said something like, well, how can we celebrate the joy of the resurrection without being in the depths of Jesus' death? How can the resurrection, the fact that Jesus came to life, really be powerful if we don't live into the despair and the brokenness that because of our sinfulness, because of the brokenness of this world, Jesus' death was also necessary. And I emphasize that we are absolutely resurrection people. But we cannot pretend that to get to the resurrection isn't terribly difficult and hard. It certainly was for Jesus, but I think as we find, as we look at this passage in Mark, we also find the message that Jesus is giving to us is if you want to get to the resurrection, if you want to get to the new life that Jesus promises you, 
if you want to get to the healing, if you want to get to the forgiveness, if you want to get to the joy, if you want to get to the contentment, the peace, then we have to reckon with our own brokenness, our own darkness. And Jesus says, we too must pick up our cross and come follow him. And that journey is not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. And if people don't want to go through hard stuff to get to the good, they'll never get to the good. At a very simple level, you know this if you've ever been an athlete or you've ever gone to school and had to study really hard. If you're an athlete, everybody dreams of the championship. Everybody dreams of making the final last shot. Everybody dreams of the degree. We don't just walk in and get those things. It takes practice. It takes hard work. It takes falling down. It takes missing. It takes sweat. It takes tears. And in a similar way, Jesus is saying that if you want to experience my joy, I will give it to you as a gift, but you're going to have to give up your life. You're going to have to give up your addiction to the things of this world. And that will not be easy. It will be hard. So let's look at this passage and talk about each of these elements together. I'm actually going to break this passage up. It's kind of long. And we're going to read a section of it, and then we'll make a point, and then we're going to go on to the next section. But I think you'll find these themes throughout. So let's start at verse 27. This is Mark chapter 8, and we're going to read 27 to 30. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So this came up a couple weeks ago after the service. I actually had several people come up and say, man, we keep reading these passages in Mark, and Jesus keeps saying something like, hey, here's something cool about me, but don't tell anybody. Jesus does a miracle, and then he says, shh, don't tell anybody I just did that. Which feels a little odd, because often we show up at worship, and what's often something we talk about is, go tell everybody about Jesus. And yet Jesus himself is saying, shh. Yeah, I'm, I'm awesome, I'm a big deal, I'm doing good things, but don't tell anybody. So this is kind of known as the messianic secret for many people, but biblical scholars. And so what we find here often is that when Jesus is in non-Jewish context or Gentile context, he often does allow people to go off and tell other people. But Jesus, knowing how his ministry is going to unfold, particularly when he's in Jewish context, tells people not to rush off and make a big deal out of the things he has just done or said. And part of it is because he wants his ministry to unfold. And Jesus knows when this movement catches fire and more and more people find out not just the things he's doing, but really the claims that he's making, that he himself is God, that he is the one Messiah that is coming, that his ministry will end. They will face that persecution that leads to his death. And so Jesus' ministry lasts about three years. And over that three years, Jesus is unfolding these miracles. He's unfolding all these teachings. And he wants it to unfold in God's timing. And for it not to happen and end too quickly. It eventually does. And so we get to a point in the story where Jesus, if you remember, prays into Jerusalem. And there's crowds around the streets. And so he makes a big deal out of his presence. But he's not there yet. So that's the reason that he often asks people to hold back. But what does it say before that? It says Jesus and his di- disciples were all around him. And Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? He's setting him up with this question. What are the crowds, all these people gathered around, who do they say that I am? They give an answer. Well, some think you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah, one of the most famous prophets in the Old Testament. Others just name other prophets that you might be in the Old Testament. Who do people in our world say that Jesus is? Great teacher. good moralist, a genius, 
misunderstood, didn't exist. (laughs) Jesus takes people's understanding of him publicly then and makes it much more personal. He says, but who do you say that I am? And he asks them to make a personal commitment to understand how their view of him is distinct from everyone else in the world. So ask yourself that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you believe he is? Now, if you're anything like me, there's some language that immediately comes to mind. He's Lord and Savior. Well, that's that's good. That's biblical language. But what does that mean to you? How is he your Lord? How is he your master? What decisions do you make different than the world because Jesus is your master and he's calling the shots in your life? If you say that Jesus is your savior, what has he saved you from? Well, he saved me from my sins. Well, what sins? What brokenness? What darkness? What obstacles have you experienced Jesus saving you from? Where is Jesus saving you right now from brokenness? God's word and what Jesus is doing here is he's calling these disciples, these apostles. They might have the nice little language that they've heard from the world. He's calling them to personalize it. And you and I, because we hear this language our whole life, it just kind of flies out of our mouth. And yet Jesus repeatedly tells us to slow down and to ask the deeper more personal question, what does that mean right now to who I am and what God is up to in my life? Who do people say I am? Who do you say that I am? If you go to the next slide, it just points this out. Who do people say I am? And Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now they reply with the language that Jesus is looking for that transitions into the next section of our passage. They reply by saying, the Messiah. Some translations you have might say, you are the Christ. Messiah was a term of art that meant anointed one. And what Peter is saying is that you are the one that was prophesied throughout all the Old Testament of the Bible. You're the one that God was going to send to make all things that were broken in the world right again. It's the right answer, but Jesus is going to force them to flesh that out a little bit more and to personalize it. So let's go to the next section. This is verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Yikes, right? Now remember how this is unfolding. Peter, now Jesus had his 12 apostles, They were kind of his inside circle. But inside that circle, he had Peter, James, and John that were kind of his inner three. Peter being amongst that group. There's a lot of connections, a lot of special interactions that Peter has with Jesus. Jesus asked the question of all the apostles, who's the world think I am? And then who do you think I am? And who's the guy that raises his hand first? Peter. You're the Messiah. He gives the Bible school answer. It's the right answer. He says, Jesus, I know who you are. Immediately after that, Jesus is drawn. Do you really know what it means to know who I am? Jesus moves from these miracles and these signs and all these wonderful things that are happening now to the hard stuff. He teaches them that if I'm the Messiah, then what is supposed to happen with the Messiah, the Son of Man, I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the teachers of the law. I'm going to be killed. Peter, being the tough guy that he is, super energetic, he hears that his Messiah 
His leader is going to die, and he stands up and says, oh, no, I'd never let that happen. I'd stop him. And if you remember, he does try when Jesus is arrested. And Jesus, again, stops him and tells him not to. Jesus turns, looks at his disciples, and he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. So the next thing I want you to think about as we personalize this is this line, get behind me. Sometimes in our zeal, sometimes in our zest, we run off ahead of Jesus. We run off ahead of God. Another way of saying this is we think we know what is best and what is right and what is good. And typically that benefits us in some way. That's why we think it's right or good. Because we get some sort of benefit out of it. And to us in those circumstances, Jesus says, get behind me. And in Peter's case, he's pretty aggressive and says, Satan. Now, he doesn't mean that he thinks Peter intellectually is Satan. But he's saying this is, in this moment, exactly what Satan does in drawing people away from me. You're behaving like Satan would in the sense that you think you know what is right and wrong and you are unwilling to submit to me, especially when it's hard. Why doesn't Peter want this to happen? Because he doesn't want him to die. Because he doesn't want it to be hard. He doesn't want it to be a challenge. Sometimes in our faith lives, other people try to rescue us in this way too. You know, I've shared with you that uh, I have all sorts of struggles, and one of the things that I, I often can do, I'm not one that just starts screaming and yelling and berating people. My methodology is just as bad and just as dark, but a little more subtle. I'm passive aggressive. Sometimes the legal training causes me to cross-examine people, and so I don't just tell them what I think, but I ask five or six very strategic questions that forced them into a place that I convey what I think. Not healthy. Not okay. And I was in a community of trusted friends one day, and I'd had a conversation like this with Dana where I had cross-examined her, and I knew I was being passive-aggressive, just trying to get my way. And I was with these guys, and I was sharing this kind of as a confession, really asking for them to pray for me and to support me and trying to not do this as much. And immediately, two of the guys said, oh, gosh, that's not that big a deal. I scream at my wife all the time. And another guy said, oh, that doesn't even sound that bad. Now, our world would look at that, I think, and say, wow, look how supportive they're being of him. And yet, what are they doing here? I I could almost feel in that moment afterwards that maybe... (laughs) Jesus would be screaming at that group, get behind me, Satan. I mean, me too. I'm not saying just them. Because what are are they doing there? They're rescuing me from the brokenness that I'm wrestling with. They're, They're rescuing me from a sin that I'm confessing. They're softening it. They're trying to take away the pain and the angst and the hurt that I'm feeling because I've recognized this brokenness in my life. They're softening it. Where in a biblical sense, what Jesus is saying is that to get to the good stuff, to get to the restoration, you have to live in the brokenness for a little while. And to the extent that we soften that in other people's lives, we actually rob them of the opportunity to find forgiveness and restoration on the other side. Now, that's a hard truth because we think we're doing something nice. (laughs) We think we're being kind. But to the extent that a brother or sister in Christ is expressing some brokenness in their life to you, listen, love them well. But let them live in that confession and trust that God on the other side desires for them to find restoration in it. Jesus is dealing with Peter here. He wants to get rid of the hard stuff. 
And Jesus is reminding him, I appreciate your zeal. He'll say this elsewhere. I appreciate how excited you are. But do not think that you know where this journey is going. Do not think you know better than I do about what needs to happen for the world to be restored. Verse 34, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, here he's teaching what this looks like, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Jesus is deeper and deeper in fleshing out what it is that he means. This next line is a a famous one. You can put this up on the screen. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up my cross and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The language here that Jesus uses, he gives us some examples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And then he says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? He forces us to ask our question of our motivations. What drives us? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, there are many aspects of our life where we want to gain the whole world. And it might look a little differently in each of our lives, but sometimes it's our bank account, sometimes it's our career, sometimes it's certain stuff. But we do, we look at the world, we look at our community, we look at our neighbors. And we tell ourselves, if I just had those things, I would have joy. I would have significance. I would have peace and no more anxiety or frustration or angst or worry. If my pictures were as perfect on social media as everyone else's, then I would have a greater self-image. And Jesus reminds his followers, and I think he reminds us as well, that those will not be the source of true joy and peace and contentment. You may gain the whole world, and some people do, but you will lose your soul in that process. You will lose your relationship with me, he's claiming. When... uh, I was, when I was in seminary, I think some of you know, I went to law school before I went to seminary. So when I was in seminary, I was working at a law firm in downtown Chicago. And I was still wrestling with my call, what I was going to do, who I was going to be, what God was calling me into. And I was wrestling with whether I wanted to be a pastor or whether I wanted to practice law. And later in my seminary career, I decided that I, I wanted to be a pastor of a church. And so I started entering into these search processes uh, just like First Union's going through now, kind of all around the country. And I had to tell the law firm I was working at, I'm taking off. I'm not going to be here much longer. I'll be here maybe six more months, but hopefully I'll find a position and I'll be off. And I still remember the, the conversation with the partner who I loved, and it was very good. And she always knew this was going to be a possibility, uh, but she wanted me to stick around. And she started kind of down this course And she was not a follower of Jesus, but she started down this course where she started to make all sorts of promises about what she could give me, stuff. And then she said, and uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to Dana about all the things that (laughs) that we could provide. 
And Dana remembers this. I did not let her talk to Dana, by the way. <laughs> but I remembered being faced with this, this tension, right? And she was telling me of these things that I think were true that could be promised. And yet I was experiencing really strongly this call to be a pastor, to serve a church. And it was really the first time in my life where I, I felt very tangibly a choice in, in two directions. And I don't think it would, have been, it would have been wrong for me to make the choice to stay at that point. But other people may make different choices and God may lead them in different directions. But for me, I knew what God was calling me into. And yet I knew how strong that temptation was. To what felt like an easier choice. It felt like a choice where the world would affirm me more if I stayed there, where I'd have more significance than the little church I served in Indiana <laughs> eventually. And Jesus is saying at a micro level every single day, every single week certainly, you and I are making these sorts of choices. And it's really not the choice, sometimes it's the choice that's right and wrong, but it's really our discernment. Are we listening? Are we paying attention to our own spirit and our soul and what God is up to, helping us navigate those decisions that demonstrate that we're trusting and we're leaning into and we're following Jesus? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. They must give up the wheel of the car. They must let Jesus drive, must let Jesus have control. And they too must take up their burden, their cross, and go and follow him. One last section. This goes into chapter 9. And this is a good sum for us because it reveals the power of Jesus. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before, him, before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Again, Peter is in this instance, and I think this part of the passage is important to connect with because it shows all of Jesus' power. It shows who Jesus truly is amongst them. And what I love is Peter is right there again. Think of the roller coaster for Peter. Peter gives the right answer. Yes, you're the Messiah. Peter is told to get behind Jesus, and he's referred to as Satan. Then Peter is there for this powerful moment where Jesus' full identity is revealed, and yet, G, the, yet Peter is very confused. And a lot of scholars still wrestle with what Peter thinks he's doing here. But he's like, I don't know. Let's build some shelters for all these people, which I just find hilarious. I might be the only one. But Peter is really confused, and he's like, let's just build these little huts for everybody. And Jesus is like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. And then his identity is fully revealed. And why I think this is so important you just show the next slide. He says, this is my son. This is God speaking. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This isn't a mere mortal. This isn't a mere human being. But the reason that you can listen to him, the reason you can trust him, the reason you can give him his lo your life to him is because he's good. Because he is God himself. Because he is God's son. He is good to listen to. He has power. I talked about authentic community earlier where I've been in these contexts where I'm sharing my own brokenness and mistakes that I make and people want to rescue us. But I've also been in contexts where everybody just kind of goes around and we share all our junk and we share our own brokenness and then everybody leaves and we're like, yeah, this is genuine, authentic community. Everybody's being real with one another. But it misses the point of the gospel, which is, yeah, we share our junk. We admit that we make mistakes. But we do that because we believe that the God of the universe can take that brokenness and make it new. Can restore all that stuff that is broken. 
And I just want to end with this in talking about Peter's life. Peter is a follower of Jesus. He's around Jesus. He walks on the water, or tries to walk on the water. Peter stands up and yells the right answer. Yes, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Yet Peter is the one that Jesus rebukes and says, get behind me, Satan. Yet Peter is the one where Jesus is being led off, who will deny that he even knows Jesus multiple times. And yet Peter is also the one who Jesus looks at and says, upon this rock, Petros, that's why he's called Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. You'll be the first leader of my church. And Peter, wrestling with this brokenness and this life of following Jesus and this picking up his cross, will be the one that will go off and share the gospel in all sorts of places. And then he will be persecuted, he will be led to death, and he'll ask to be crucified upside down because he doesn't think he's worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus. And Peter could get to that place, which is crazy to think about in our day and age. But he could get to that place because he believed that that temporary harm, that temporary death, was just that temporary. And that there was no greater joy, no greater peace than giving his entire life to the restoration power of a good and perfect God in Jesus Christ. My invitation to us this morning, to this week, is to hear this call of Jesus to a journey that will not be easy. In some ways, it will be harder, more difficult, more challenging to do that hard introspective work of looking at ourselves in the mirror and seeing how far we are often from God. But through that brokenness, through that authenticity, through that wrestling with our world, God assures us of a greater peace, a greater joy, a greater forgiveness, a greater hope that transcends anything the world could ever touch. And he invites us to be his followers as Peter was. Let's pray together and then we'll sing one final song together. Father, your gospel is not easy. It is good news. It is truly good news, but we don't pretend that it's easy. Father, help us to walk that journey with you. We thank you that you have done the enormous work that you have in offering yourself, in loving us so deeply that you're willing to die on our behalf, by having such great power that you defeated death by your resurrection, and you invite us into this life of following you. Help us to do so with confidence and help us to do so behind you, following you, seeking you, listening to you, and discerning where you might be leading us this day and every day of our lives. Amen.